Good evening. And welcome to q and I'm Tony Jones and answering your questions tonight, world-renowned evolutionary biologist and author of The God Delusion, Richard Dawkins. And, wait a minute. <laughs> Hold your applause just for a moment. And Australia's most senior Catholic churchman, the Archbishop of Sydney, Cardinal George Pell. Please welcome our special guest. <laughs> OK, Q&A is live from 9.35 Eastern Time and simulcast on News24 and News Radio. Go to our website to send a question or join the Twitter conversation using the hashtag on your screen. And stay tuned for the chance to join Quanda Vote. You can register on your smartphone or a smart device at the address on the screen. The address is quandavote.tv, I should say. Our first question tonight comes from Naomi Rezith. At Easter, Australia's religious leaders invoke the name of God in order to preach peace, tolerance, political integrity, social and moral uh, fortitude, all obviously positive and worthwhile values. My question is, in what way is the practice of these values dependent on an existing God? Is it possible for an atheist to be, to be a peace-loving, socially responsible person. Richard Dawkins, let's start with you. Well, obviously, the answer to that question is yes. I mean, that could hardly be otherwise. Um, it is true that uh, Christianity has adopted many of the best values of, huma of humanity, but they don't belong to Christianity or, indeed, to any other religion. I think it would be very sad if it were true that you really did need religion in order to be good. Because if you think about it, what that would mean would be either that you get your morals and your values from the Bible or the Quran or some other holy book, or that you are good only because you're frightened of God, because you don't want to go to hell or you do want to go to heaven. Now, as for getting your morals from the Bible, I very sincerely hope nobody does get their morals from the Bible. It's true that you can find the occasional good verse, and the Sermon on the Mount would be, would be one example, but it's lost amid the awful things that are dotted throughout the Old Testament and actually throughout the New Testament as well because the, the idea, the fundamental idea of New Testament Christianity, which is that Jesus is the Son of God who is redeeming humanity from original sin, the idea that we are born in sin and the only way we can be redeemed from sin is through the death of Jesus. I mean, that's a horrible idea. It's a horrible idea that God, this paragon of wisdom and uh, uh, knowledge, power, couldn't think of a better way to forgive us our sins than to come down to earth in his outer ego as his son and have himself hideously tortured and executed so that he could forgive himself. OK, let's go to George Bell on that. Well, there's, there's quite a few things that uh, might be said. Uh, first of all, our tradition goes back about 4,000 years. So whatever these values are uh, that uh, we've taken over, we've got to go back a little bit of a distance. And it's interesting to look at uh, pagan Rome before there was Christian influence. 40% were slaves. Men and women fought one another to the death in the, you know, the, the Circus Maximus or the Colosseum. Women... Uh, had no rights uh, whatsoever. Uh, infanticide was practised regularly. Uh, the noble families didn't want baby girls. Christianity changed that, not perhaps by itself, but largely. And um, the Christian story... Uh, we're Christians. We're New Testament people. There was an evolution in the Old Testament. Uh, and there are some uh, awful things there. It developed. The notion of God was purified as it went through the uh, Old uh, Testament. Can I, can I just interrupt you, just to bring you to the point of the question, which was really about whether atheists can lead a good life and be good people and oh, socially yeah, responsible and so on. Yeah, absolutely. You accept that? Yeah, absolutely. I think it helps to, uh, to believe in God because uh, there's a the Polish poet, Milos, who says that the opium of the people today is the belief that they won't be judged by God when they die. That those who've committed great crimes, done awful things, are going to get away with it, 
and uh, that the people who've suffered uh, unjustly, had terrible lives, that's it. OK. Let's move to, quickly to our second question. It's from uh, Claire Bonner. Uh, religion is precisely often blamed for being the root of war and conflict. But what about all the good it has done for our society? God's sense of religion has been the birthplace of schools, universities, hospitals and, and countless developments in science as well. Richard, if you believe the human drive to seek the truth and to constantly improve ourselves is merely a, a mechanism for survival, then what's the point and why should I bother? <laughs> it's an astonishing idea to say why should you bother just because we have a scientific understanding of why we're here. We do have a scientific understanding of why, why we're here and we therefore have to make up our own meaning to life. We have to uh, find our own purposes in life which are not derived directly from uh, our scientific history. Um, when you say that Christianity has been responsible for a lot of good, including science, by the way, which is somewhat ironic, um, I think that most of the great benefits in humanity, such as the abolition of slavery, uh, such as the emancipation of women, which the Cardinal both uh, mentioned both of, um, these have been wrung out of the, our Christian history without much support from, uh, from Christianity. I, as an atheist, my friends as, an, as atheists, lead thoroughly worthwhile lives, in our opinion, because we stand up, look the world in the face, face up to the fact that we are not going to last forever. We have to make the most of the short time that we have on this planet. We have to make this planet as good as we possibly can and try to leave it a better place than we found it. Now, to some degree, you've already answered this, but there is a follow-up question. I'm going to go to that now. It's from Rebecca Ray. For you today is without religion, where is the basis of our values? And in time, will we uh, perhaps revert back to Darwin's idea of survival of the fittest? Richard Dawkins, you can answer that, and I'll bring in Cardinal Pell. I very much hope that we don't revert to the idea of survival of the fittest in planning our politics and our values and our way of life. I've often said that I'm a passionate Darwinian when it comes to explaining why we exist. It's undoubtedly the reason why we're here and why all living things are here. But to live our lives in a Darwinian way, to make up, to make a society a Darwinian society, that would be a very unpleasant sort of society in which to live. It would be a sort of Thatcherite uh, society. Um, and we want to, I mean, in a way, I feel that one of the reasons for learning about Darwinian evolution is as an object lesson in how not to uh, set up our values and our, and our social lives. George Pell. Well, well, it's interesting because I, th I think in the space of about two minutes, uh, Richard has said two different things. Uh, one of them, which is that science can't tell us uh, why uh, we're here, and then uh, in the next minute, uh, uh, trying to say that it does. No, no, I, I said it can tell us why we're here. But it can't. Well, I, I, I simply well, contradict well, you in that case. Well, what, what, uh, would, what is the reason that science gives why we're here? Science tells us how things happen. Science tells us nothing about why there was the Big Bang. That's right. Why there is a transition from inanimate matter to living matter. Science is silent on... Uh, we could solve m most of the questions in science and it would leave all the problems of life almost completely untouched. Why be good? There are... Qu uh, why be good is a separate question which I also uh, came to. Why we exist... You're playing with the word why there. Science is working on the problem of the antecedent factors that lead to our existence. Now, why in any further sense than that, why in the sense of purpose, is, in my opinion, not a meaningful question. You cannot ask a question like, why do mountains exist, as though mountains had some kind of purpose. What you can say is what are the causal factors that lead to the existence of mountains, and the same with life and the same with the universe. Now, science over the centuries has gradually pieced together answers <clears throat> to those questions. Why in that sense? It's true that there are still some gaps, but surely, Cardinal, you're not going to fall for the god of the gaps trap, I, of saying I... that... Um, that religion is going to fill in those gaps which science has so far not yet answered. No, I, I'm not going to be diverted at all. I'm happy to come back to that. Okay. 
Uh, uh, we will be coming back to it because I know there are questions that uh, relate good, to some good. of the bigger yeah. issues you're talking about. But you can respond and then we'll move on to our next I, I hope I'll be allowed to. You certainly Thanks. will. <laughs> uh, uh, the, um, it's part of being human to ask uh, why we exist. Questioning distinguishes us uh, from the animals. It's uh, to, to ask uh, uh, why we're here. So I repeat, and uh, this is a commonplace uh, in science, science uh, has nothing to say about that. As uh, whatever it might say about mountains, it, it can't say what is the purpose of human life. And uh, it's not Maggie Thatcher who was uh, in the epitome or the personification of social Darwinism, it's Hitler and Stalin. Oh. <laughs> yeah. I yeah, have because said... it's, the, it's the struggle of, uh, for survival, the strong take what they can and the weak give what they must and there's nothing to restrain them and we've seen that in the two great atheist movements of the last uh, oh, century. No, that's ridiculous. That is ridiculous. <laughs> Nice unbiased audience you've assembled here, by the way. <laughs> right. Let, let's, let's clearly distinguish two, th two things here. First, atheism had nothing to do with Hitler or Stalin. Stalin... <laughs> <laughs> Stalin was an atheist, Hitler was not. It doesn't matter what they were with respect to atheism, they did their horrible things for entirely different reasons. Now, <laughs> you are right when you say that aspects of what Hitler tried to do could be regarded as arising out of Darwinian natural selection. That's exactly why I said that I despise Darwinian natural selection as a motto for how we should live. I tried to say we should not live by Darwinian principles, but Darwinian principles explain how we got here and why we exist in the scientific sense. Now, Cardinal, you said it's part of human nature to want to ask the question why, mm -hmm. in the sense of purpose. It may very well be part of human nature, but that doesn't make it a valid question. There are all sorts of questions which you can ask. <laughs> What's funny about that? <laughs> what is funny about okay, that? OK, we'd like the audience not to yell out. If we can do yeah. that, that'd be great. Um, we're going to move on. I, uh, I didn't finish, I'm sorry. OK, yeah. we'll finish your point. Okay. Because there are lots of questions pertaining to this. We will the question back. why is not necessarily a question that deserves to be answered. There are all sorts of questions that people can ask, like, what is the colour of jealousy? That's a silly question. Exactly. Why is a silly question? <laughs> Why is a silly question? You can ask, what are the factors that led to something coming into existence? That's a sensible question. But what is the purpose of the universe is a silly question. It, it has no meaning. Could, could, could I just interpose very briefly? Very briefly. I think... It's a very poignant and real question to ask, why is there suffering? We will be asking that question, believe it or not. <laughs> this is Q&A. It's live and interactive. Tonight we're experimenting with Quandavote, a new way for Q&A viewers to share their opinions on the issues we discuss. You can go to the quandavote.tv website on your smartphone, tablet or computer to vote in our very first question, and that is, does religious belief make the world a better place? Does religious belief make the world a better place? <laughs> we'll report back later on your views. First, let's move on to our next question from our, for our panel. It comes from Paul Hanrahan. My question's for Richard Dawkins. You're on the record as saying so you can't prove that God doesn't, that God doesn't exist and um, you say you're agnostic rather than atheistic. Why do you appear as the champion of atheism around the world? Why do you accept offers to appear as the champion of atheism, and why are you so evangelical in the prosecution of your cause? Isn't that a touch hypocritical and unscientific? Yes, uh, Richard Dawkins, I'm a bit confused about this because you just referred to yourself a moment moments ago as being an atheist, and yet um, with the Archbishop of Canterbury you referred to yourself as an agnostic. In The God Delusion, I made a seven-point scale. One is I'm totally confident there is a God. Seven is I'm totally confident there is not a God. Um, six is, to all intents and purposes, I'm an atheist, I live my life as though there is no God, but any scientist of any sense will not say that they positively can disprove the existence of anything. Um, I cannot disprove the existence of the Easter Bunny, and so I'm agnostic about the Easter Bunny. It's in the same respect that I'm agnostic about 
about God. Good so, what proof, by the way, would change your mind? It's a very, that's a very difficult and interesting question because, um, I mean, I used to think that, uh, that if somehow, you know, great big giant 900 foot high Jesus with a voice like Paul Ropes and suddenly strode in and said, I exist, here I am. Um, but even that, I actually sometimes wonder whether that would... I think you're hallucinating. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I agree. Can I, can, I agree. Can I make... I agree. Uh, well, that, well, that, can, I, can I ask can you... Well, can I just put a question to you? Could, could you ever provide Richard Dawkins with the sort of proof he requires for belief, scientific proof of the existence of God? Uh, no, because I think he only accepts proof uh, that is rooted in sense experience. In other words, he uh, excludes the world of metaphysics, say, the principle of contradiction, and he excludes... Uh, the possibility of uh, arguments that go, don't go against reason, but go uh, beyond it. But, but could, I, could I make one little suggestion as to why uh, Richard calls himself an atheist? Because in one of his blogs in 2002, uh, he was discussing whether he's an agnostic or a non-theist. He said he prefers to use the term atheist because it's more explosive, it's more dynamic. You can do, you can shake people up. Whereas if you're just going around, going around saying that you're uh, an agnostic or a non-theist, it's not... Uh, that, these are his own words. Well, well let, let's let Richard Dawkins... I, I don't bottom. remember saying that. It's, it, wouldn't, it wouldn't totally surprise me. It's a... It's, a, um, it's, in, it's in 2002. It's an ongoing issue, what, what's the best way... Oh. That, there, there is a problem with the word atheist, but, um, especially in America. I don't know whether it's true in, in Australia. There's a, a lovely woman... Um, I'm blocking on her name because I'm jet lagged. Um, uh, she's Irish American woman. Any, anybody, anybody help me? There are quite so, a few Irish American women. Sorry, <laughs> <laughs> sorry about that. Um, <laughs> sorry? No. Um, I, anyway, I do apologise personally she, to her for do? forgetting her name. She's an actress and she's got a. Uh, she did a film on um, how she escaped from the Roman Catholic Church, and it's a very moving film. And at the end, um, her mother discovered that she was an atheist, and her mother phoned her up and said, well, I don't mind you not believing in God, but an atheist? <laughs> Her name's Julia Sweeney, so it's suddenly come back to me. I strongly recommend that. Now, the point is that the word atheist, unlike just simply not believing in God, uh, has uh, bad connotations. And so, to some extent, people have wished to, to depart from that and change the name to non-theist or secularist or non-believer. And I waver back and forth as to what's the best name to use. I sometimes call myself an atheist, sometimes a non-theist, uh, and, and sometimes just a non-believer. George Pell, can I just come back to you on this question of the existence of God? Why would God randomly um, decide to provide proof of his existence to a small group of Jews 2,000 years ago <laughs> and not subsequently provide any proof after that? Um, well, I don't think there's ever been any scientific proof. I don't believe God does anything randomly although he might, set up, uh, he might set up a system which works apparently through, um, you know, through chance, through, through random... Uh, but if you, want to get somebody, if you want something done, you've got to ask somebody. It's no good, uh, say, my asking a con everyone in the congregation, will you do something? Uh, and normally you go to a busy person because you know they'll do it. And so for some extraordinary reason, uh, God chose the Jews. They weren't... <coughs> Intellectually, the equal of either the Egyptians uh, or the uh, intellectual, per, intellectually, how, how morally. Can you, how can you know intellectually? Uh, because you see the fruits of their civilization. Now, uh, Egypt was the great power for thousands of years uh, before uh, Christianity. Persia was a, a great power. Chaldea, uh, the the poor, the little Jewish people, they were originally shepherds. They were stuck. They're, they're still stuck but that's between not, these that's, great that's powers. That's not a reflection of your intellectual capacity, is it, whether or not you're a shepherd? Well... <laughs> uh, uh, no, it's not, but it's a, it's a recognition... It is a reflection of your intellectual development. Really? But like many, many people are very, very clever and not... Uh, uh, not uh, highly intellectual, but my point but, is... Uh, sorry, that... Can I just interrupt? Are you including Jesus in that, who obviously was Jewish and uh, was, of that, was of that community? Uh, exactly. So, intellectually, not up to it? Oh. <laughs> uh, 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 well, that's... 
That's a nice try, Tony. Uh, uh, the, the people, uh, in terms of sophistication, uh, the Psalms are remarkable. In terms of uh, their buildings and that sort of thing, they don't compare with the great, uh, with the great uh, powers. But uh, Jesus came not as a philosopher to the elite. He came to the poor and the battlers. And for some reason, he chose a very difficult, uh, but um, actually they are now, an intellectually elite, because uh, over the centuries they've been pushed out of every other form of work. Um, there are, I mean, Jesus, I think, is the greatest, uh, son, the son of God, but leaving that aside, the greatest man that ever lived. So I've got a great admiration for the Jews, but we don't need to exaggerate their contribution uh, okay. in their early days. All right, you're uh, watching Q&A. Remember, you can send your web or video questions to our website. The address is on the screen to find out how to do that. Our next question is a video. It comes from Andrew Watson in Blackburn, Victoria. Question for Richard Dawkins. The big bangers believe that once there was nothing, then suddenly, poof, the universe was created from a big bang. If I have nothing in the palm of my hand, close my fingers, speak the word bang, then open my fingers again, still I find there is nothing there. I ask you to explain to us in layman's terms how it is that something as enormous as the universes came from nothing. Richard Dawkins. Well, obviously, you're not a physicist. Um, no. <laughs> and nor am I. And uh, I am delighted to say that uh, during my time in Australia, I shall be having a number of conversations, public conversations, with my colleague Lawrence Krauss, uh, including one in the Sydney Opera House uh, later, I think it's next week. Um, and he, he's written a book on exactly that topic of how you can get something from nothing, and I shall be questioning him about that. Of course it's counterintuitive that you can get something from nothing. Of course common sense doesn't allow you to get something from nothing. That's why it's interesting. It's got to be interesting in order to give rise to the universe at all. Something pretty mysterious had to give rise to the origin of the universe. Now, if you want to, re to replace, if you want to replace a physical explanation by an intelligent god, that's an even worse explanation. It's an even more difficult explanation. What scientists are trying to do is to explain how you can get not just something, but the immense complexity of the, of the world, of the universe, and of life. And science is making a pretty good fist of doing that. Uh, life is now completely solved, barring the details. That was Darwin's contribution and yeah. Darwin's uh, su successors. Physicists are still working on the origin of the cosmos. Among them is Lawrence Krauss, whom I, whom I shall be talking to uh, next week. Now, it is very mysterious how the universe came into being. It's a deeply mysterious and interesting question. And, and can I just interrupt? It's an old question, a very old question. Thomas Aquinas in the 13th century was asking the same question. He said, there must have been a time when no physical things existed, but something can't come from nothing. That was his view. It's just well, been repeated by us. Something uh, can come from nothing, yeah. and that's what physicists are now, are now telling us. Um, I could give you... You asked me to give you a, a layman's interpretation. It would be a very, very layman's interpretation. Um, when you have um, matter and antimatter and you put them together, um, they cancel each other out and give rise to, to nothing. What Lawrence Krauss is now suggesting is that if you start with nothing, the process can go into reverse and produce matter and antimatter. The, the theory is still being worked out. It's a very difficult theory, mathematical theory. I'm not qualified to answer the, the, the question, but what I am sure about is that it most certainly is not solved by postulating an intelligence, a creative intelligence, who raises even bigger questions of his own existence. That certainly is not going to be the answer, whatever else is. George Pell. Thank you. Um, but the trouble... Well, there are many troubles with Richard's uh, teachings, but a, a fundamental one is that he dumbs down God and he soups up nothing. <laughs> uh, he, 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 can, he continually talks as though God is some sort of upmarket figure within space and time. 
Now, from 450, 500 BC, uh, where with the Greek uh, philosophers, God is outside space and time. God is necessary, self-sufficient, uncaused, unconditioned. That's the hypothesis you've got to uh, wrestle with. The second thing is that Krauss says nothing about uh, uh, the Big Bang coming out of nothing. Uh, and he, it's, admittedly, he comes clean in, on about six pages from the end of his book, and I don't know whether Richard has read it that far because he gave it uh, a, a foreword. Uh, what he says is, is uh, what, he, what the Richard is describing as nothing is a sort of a, a mixture of particles and perhaps uh, a vacuum with electromagnetic uh, forces working on it. That's uh, what Krauss is talking about under the heading of nothing. And there's a very good uh, review of this in the New York uh, Times. Not a pro-religious paper at all, uh, where the, Krauss is absolutely um, <coughs> denied and, and demolished, although uh, uh, especially by his, his supporters claiming that he says things come out of nothing. He, he doesn't say that. It's okay, a matter, you can quickly respond to you that can, You can question. dispute exactly what, what's meant by, by nothing, but whatever yeah. it is, it's very, very simple. <laughs> and <laughs> Why is that funny? <laughs> well, I think it's a bit funny to be trying to define nothing. Can I put that to you as a question? Is it, is it equally... Um, feasible, since you can't prove the existence of God, that the nothing you're talking about is in fact some creative force? If you talk about a God who is a creative intelligence, then that is something very complicated and very improbable and something that requires explaining in its own right. The nothing that Lawrence Krauss is talking about, whether or not it's what a naive person would conceive as nothing or what a sophisticated physicist would consider to be nothing. It is going to be something much, much simpler than a creative intelligence. We are struggling, we're all struggling, scientists are struggling, to explain how we get the fantastic order and complexity of the universe out of very simple and therefore easy to understand, easy to explain beginnings. Lawrence Krauss calls the uh, the, the substrate of his explanation, nothing. It's possible to dispute whether nothing is quite the right word, but whatever it is, it is very, very simple and therefore is a worthy premise for an explanation. Whereas a god, a creative intelligence, is not a worthy substrate for an explanation because it is already something very complicated. And it's no good invoking Thomas Aquinas and saying that God is defined as outside time and space. That's just a cop-out. That's just an evasion of the responsibility to explain. That's just setting out what you want to prove before you've even started. OK, let's move on to a question... Let's move on to a question on evolution for uh, Cardinal Peltz from Joe Blades. As a young Catholic scientist, I'd like to ask the Cardinal to clarify the Roman Catholic Church's position on evolution and comment on whether the dichotomy between science and religion is in fact real. Uh, well, science and religion are two different uh, uh, activities and um, in the Catholic Church um, you can believe to, to some extent what you like about uh, evolution. Um, I think Darwin made a great contribution. It, uh, uh, I remember talking with Julius Kornberg, a very distinguished biologist, and he's worked with ants for years. And he said, you know, he's managed to change them by changing the, uh, the conditions. Uh, but there are a number of things that uh, evolution uh, doesn't explain. Darwin realised that. Darwin was a theist because he said he couldn't believe that the immense cosmos and all the beautiful things in the world came about either by chance or out of necessity. He said, I have to be ranked as a uh, theist. Now, so that's just not true. I, excuse it's me, just it's plain a, not true. It's on page 92 of his autobiography. <laughs> Go and have a look. Sorry, can I, can, I just, can I just bring you, in a sense, to the point of the question? Do you accept that humans evolved from apes? Yeah, probably. From Neanderthals, yes. Whether... Okay. From Neanderthals? Probably. 
Why from Neanderthals? Well, why, who else? Who else would you suggest? <laughs> Neanderthals were our cousins. We're not descended from them. And we're both descended from... <laughs> uh, are, these, uh, are these extant cousins? What? Where will I find a Neanderthal today if they're my cousins? <laughs> they're not extant, they're extinct. Exactly, they're that's up. my point. <laughs> Your point is that because they're not... E that because they're extant, they can't be our cousins. <laughs> I really am not much fussed. <laughs> That's very uh, clear. Uh, uh, something in the evolutionary story seems to have come before uh, humans. Uh, a lot of people say it's the can, can we say this? Humans, you accept that humans evolved from non-humans. So let me put this to you as a question. At what point in this evolutionary scale was a soul imparted to the humans from God? Uh, look, a soul isn't... Uh, uh, it's not like putting a spot of gin in a tonic. Yeah. The soul is the principle of life. Mm. So whenever there was uh, a principle of life that could question, that could be open to awe, that was able to communicate, then we had uh, the first human. Now, we believe that the first humans uh, developed in South Africa, uh, I'm not quite sure um, how long ago, and that all the uh, you know, humans have, have developed uh, from that. Uh, we know most about that. There aren't uh, remains. We know most about that because of the drawings they left on, the, uh, uh, on walls and caves and that sort of thing. No such thing from Neanderthals. Uh, so we can't say exactly when there was a first uh, human. But we have to say if there are humans, there must be, have been a first one. They might have been equal first. But if there, if there is a progression, they've got to be first. So, um, are you talking about a kind of Garden of Eden scenario with an actual Adam and Eve? Well, um, what Adam and Eve uh, terms, what do they mean? Life and Earth. It's like every man. That's a, a beautiful, sophisticated, a mythological uh, account. It's not science, but it's there to tell us two or three things. First of all, that God created the world and the, the universe. Secondly, that the key to the whole of the universe, the really significant thing, are humans. And thirdly, it's a very sophisticated mythology to try to explain the evil and the suffering. But of the it world. isn't a literal truth. You shouldn't it's see it in any way as being an historical or literal truth. Uh, it's certainly not a scientific truth, and uh, it's, it's a religious story told for religious purposes. And uh, just, just quickly, uh, because the Old Testament in particular is full of these kind of stories. I mean, is there a point where you distinguish between metaphor and reality? For example, Moses receiving the Ten Commandments uh, inscribed directly by God on a mountain. Uh, I'm not sure that the Old Testament says that uh, uh, God inscribed the Ten Commandments, uh, but leaving that aside, it's difficult to know uh, how exactly that worked, but there, Moses was a great man. There was a great encounter with the divine. Actually, with Moses, we get the key that enables us to come together with the Greeks with, with reason because Moses said, who will I tell the Egyptians? And he said, tell that my name is, I am who I am. OK. I'm, I'm, and, I'm, I'm going we'll to gonna bring Richard Dawkins back in here because we've, we've moved from evolution, obviously, to uh, the biblical versions of it. Your response? Uh, well, um, I'm curious to know if, if um, Adam and Eve never existed, where did original sin come from? But I, I also would like to clarify the point about uh, whether there ever was a first human. It, that's a rather difficult and, and puzzling question because um, we know that the previous species from which we're um, descended is probably Homo erectus and before that um, some sort of um, Australopithecine. Yeah. But there never was a last Homo erectus who gave birth to the first Homo sapiens. Every creature ever born belonged to the same species as its parents. The process of evolution is so gradual that you can never say, aha, now suddenly we have the first human. Um, it was always a case of just a slightly different from the previous generation. That's a scientific point, which I think is quite interesting. I'm not sure if it has a theological significance, except that uh, I think successive popes have tried to suggest that um, the soul did indeed get added, rather like gin to tonic, um, at some particular point during evolution. At, at some point in evolution, uh, there was no soul, 
and then later there was one. So it is quite an interesting question to ask. Now we have rather a good fossil record from Africa of the descent of, of humans, from Australopithecines to, to various species of Homo, perhaps Homo habilis, perhaps Homo erectus, then archaic Homo sapiens, and then um, modern Homo sapiens. At what point did the soul get in injected? Um, and what does the idea of original sin mean if Adam and Eve never existed? I'll, I'll just quickly let you respond to that. Uh, yeah, well, I mean, God uh, wasn't running around giving injections. <laughs> and if there is no first person, where we're this, not where humans. Did, where did the soul come from then? The in soul the, in is the, the principle of, of life. Mm. But, 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 there are but, animal souls. Do, do jellyfish. A, all living things have some principle of life. The, the, uh, uh, an animal has a principle of life. A human has... Uh, uh, a soul, a principle of life, which is immensely more sophisticated. We even have a voice box, so that, which is one of the great miracles, so that we can communicate our thoughts to one another rather than just uh, grunting. I'm pleased we're not grunting tonight. Let's move <laughs> along. You can, uh, by the way, don't forget, you can still vote at uh, quanda.vote, uh, sorry, quandavote.tv, I should say, on the question, does religious belief make the world a better place? Over 15,000 viewers have already voted, and we'll check before the end of the program for the final results. Our next question for Pro Professor Dawkins and Cardinal Pell is a video, and it comes from Kieran Dennis in Fern Tree, Gully, Victoria. My question is for George Pell. George. As a climate change sceptic, you demand a very high standard of evidence to support the hypothesis that global warming has an anthropogenic cause. My question is, why then do you not demand the same standard of evidence for the existence of God? George Bell. <laughs> uh, I'm very, very happy to answer that. Uh, first of all, I'm not a sceptic about uh, climate change. I grew up in Ballarat. The weather was always... I worked for years in Melbourne. If you don't like the weather in Melbourne, wait 20 minutes. Uh, uh, think of all the nonsense people like Flannery told us about years of drought here, and now we're, co we're coping with flood. So you're so can, can, can I just clarify back. that you're a sceptic about global warming I'm, leading to climate change? I'm, I'm, I'm a sceptical... I'm a sceptical uh, about the hum human contribution to dangerous climate change. I think that is not established. And, and, is, and sorry, is that because you're sceptical about scientific consensus? And is that partly driven no, 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 by, the, by what scientists believe about religion? No, it's got nothing to do with it. Uh, on, on, the, on the weather question, I go on the evidence. When you come to talk about God, that is not a scientific question. The scientists uh, uh, concede that. Uh, it is a question. Uh, that is open, I believe, to reason. You have to reason about the facts of science. Uh, ask whether you believe that uh, the suggestion that, um, you know, random selection um, is, is sufficient. And also, most evolutionary biologists today don't believe that. Don't believe uh, what? They don't believe in uh, uh, random, so this crude fundamentalist version of random selection that you propose. I do not propose it, and um, I strongly deny that, that evolution is random selection. Good. Evolution is non-random selection. Oh, non so there's a, there's a purpose to it, is there? No. <laughs> could, could, could you explain what non-random means? Yes, of course I could, as my life's work. Um, <laughs> <laughs> It's there, a hard thing to say, but keep it brief. <laughs> there's random genetic variation and non-random survival and, and a non-random reproduction, which is why, as the generations go by, animals get better at doing what they do. That is quintessentially non-random. It does not mean there's a purpose in the sense of a human purpose, in the sense of a guiding principle which is thought up in advance. With hindsight, you can say something like a bird's wing looks as though it has a purpose. A human eye looks as though it has a purpose, but it has come about through the process of non-random natural selection. There is no purpose in the human sense. There's a kind of pseudo-purpose, but it's not a purpose in the human sense of conscious uh, guiding. But above all, I must stress that Darwinian evolution is a non-random process. One of the biggest misunderstandings, which I'm sorry to say the Cardinal's just perpetrated, uh, is, that there is, some, is that evolution is a random process. It is the opposite of a random process. Thank you. Thank you.
A, a brief uh, response to that, if you can. Uh, uh, yes, um, that, that's, uh, that is uh, fascinating because most evolutionary biologists today believe that the animal world is uh, developing according to patterns, which uh, when we're starting to know more and more um, about them. And um, are you referring to intelligent design? No, I'm not. Uh, I'm leaving that uh, right uh, to one side. I, I Do just you believe I, in intelligent design? Uh, I or believe. That, or I be that there's an intelligent designer? I believe God is intelligent. No, but I'm. I, uh, how how we work? It's, it's obviously a it's obviously a loaded question. But do you believe in intelligent design uh, well, and then, an intelligent designer? It, it all depends uh, what you mean. I believe God created the world. I'm not entirely sure uh, how it works out uh, uh, scientifically, but uh, I, I wonder, you know, whether Richard believes that the order, the patterns we see uh, uh, in nature, whether they are real or whether they're an illusion. I'm going to leave that question. They up are in the air. real. All right. Yeah. Okay. I, I, you, you, that's a quick answer. Um, let's go to our next question. It is a video. It comes from Matthew Thompson in Tawong, Victoria. I'm an atheist. What do you think will happen when I die, and how do you know? <laughs> George Powell, we'll start with you. You ought to be an authority on this, I imagine. Uh, well, I know uh, from the Christian point of view, God loves everybody that every genuine motion towards the truth is a motion towards God. And uh, when an atheist dies, like everybody else, they'll be judged on the extent uh, to which they have moved towards goodness and truth and beauty. But in the Christian view, God loves uh, everyone, except those who turn his back, uh, turn their back on him through uh, evil acts. Oh, so atheism, not an evil act? No, not an... In, well, no, I don't... Most cases, it's not. So, so many so, honest so, well, atheists... I, mean, I guess, to, to get to the point of the question, I suppose, I mean, he may, may be having a little wager here, but um, is it possible for an atheist to go to heaven? Uh, well, it's not my business. No, but... I, well, <laughs> uh, you're, you're the only but authority we have here. I, I would say, <laughs> certainly. Yeah. Certainly. <laughs> and just, just on the subject of heaven, if we can, what is your own concept of what heaven is? Well, even St Paul was severely agnostic, but one, one way in which the uh, Christians differ from the Greeks, the Greeks believed in the immortality of the soul. Uh, we Christians uh, believe uh, with one section of the Jewish people uh, in the resurrection of the body. So, uh, in some sense, we will be there as continuing persons. In some, with a new heaven and a new earth, with all the good things that we've done will be incorporated into the new heaven and new earth. How it'll work out, I don't know, because I think physically and morally and intellectually we're at our peak at different stages in our life. Mm. How it'll work out, I've got no idea, but that's, that's the, the general outline of but, Christian but teaching. But you, 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 you believe, you think about it as a, as a kind of collection of individual souls. In fact, obviously billions and billions of individual souls with their own personality existing in some uh, yeah, galactic uh, that, space. That, I think that's a traditional... Well, uh, that, it's certainly the traditional Christian view. It's, it's the view that I uh, accept. And it's also the view of, of some of the Jews. Richard Dawkins. <laughs> well, the answer to the question of uh, what's going to happen when, when we die depends whether we're buried, cremated or give our bodies to science. Um, <laughs> I, I'm... Um, can, I mean, I just, can I say this? Uh, if, you, if you're actually an agnostic and you keep aside this small portion of your brain um, for subsequent proof. I mean, you might get presented with that proof when you die. The brain is what we do our thinking with. The brain is going to rot. That's, that's, that's all there is to it. Um, I'm intrigued by the cardinals saying that the Christians believe you're going to be resurrected in the body. I mean, that's an astonishing I idea, and I, I don't believe you really mean that. And I, and I think... Um, <laughs> Just, just as I don't believe you really mean that the, the wafer turns into the body of Christ. You must mean body in some rather special sense. Um, uh, 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 Mr Dawkins, I don't say things I don't mean. <laughs> well, then what do you mean? <laughs> do you, uh, if do you, you, you I'll, I'll tell you. And I've just explained what the bodily re re resurrection means to the extent that I can understand it. I certainly believe that when the words of, of consecration are uttered, that they become the body and blood of Christ. Now, I, I've had a little kid come up to me when that was explained and say, can I have a look in the chalice to see if it's turned to blood? 
And of course it hasn't. We, we don't uh, believe that. Uh, it's not against reason. I believe it because I believe the man who told us that was also the Son of God. He says, this is my body, this is my blood. And I'd much prefer to listen to him and take his word than yours. But... <laughs> But other, but other Christian denominations are quite happy to take that as a symbolic, uh, metaphorical meaning. Um, Catholics take it as a literal meaning, and I take it. I'm, I'm trying to be charitable by trying to suggest that it's that same sense in which you say that the, the, the body is resurrected, because the body is certainly not resurrected in terms of the cell, the protoplasm, the proteins, the DNA. That doesn't happen any more than the wafer turns into, into that. You're, you're right when you said that... The, to, to that to the child. So you do not mean that the wafer turns into the body in any sense in which normal English language usage would, uh, would understand. You mean it in some other sense, and I take it, it's that same sense that the body is resurrected. Uh, well, can I, can I ask you whether you do mean it in a metaphorical sense, in the I, same I, way that you believe Adam no, and Eve I, are metaphorical I, 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 creatures? I, I, I don't. Uh, I follow it. I, I understand it. Uh, according to a system of metaphysics that was spelled out by the Greeks before Christ came, which we've adopted. And that is, uh, there's a substance which is the core uh, uh, of a being, and it is revealed to us through what are called accidents. Now, I believe that the core uh, of the being becomes the, uh, the bread, becomes the body and blood of Christ. It continues to look exactly as it was. Uh, we believe that in the Catholic Church. Now, I know you're a cultural Anglican, uh, and we can't blame the... I'm also a rationalist. I mean, <laughs> I, mean I, I use... English is my native language. Uh, the wafer does not become the body of anybody okay. in the English language. Right, no, I, th I think we've resolved that we both... Well, that you both disagree on this point uh, <laughs> rather substantially. Let's go to our next question, which is from Michael Matty. Um, is it OK to tell a child that God doesn't exist? Richard Dawkins. I think it's OK to tell a child the truth. Uh, what I, but I would prefer to um, encourage a child to make up her own mind and to think uh, about the evidence and to believe things when there is evidence. What I think is not OK, what I think is deeply immoral, is to tell a child that when she dies, if she's not good, she's going to go to hell. That seems to me to be mental child abuse and an utter disgrace. <laughs> Uh, I remember when I was in England, we were preparing some uh, young English boys. Uh, they're from very... Uh, uh, preparing them for... for... Come thank, on. Thank you. Uh, preparing them for First Communion. And uh, they were uh, very patriotic young lads. And uh, one of them announced uh, very breezily to me uh, that he didn't believe in hell. And, uh, I mean, certainly the idea of any child being sent to hell, I agree that that is uh, grotesque and that's, uh, that's not the Christian God. But anyhow, this, this kid, I said to kid, this kid, I said simply, um, Hitler? Do you think Hitler might be in hell? Started the Second World War, caused the death of 50 million? Or would you prefer a system where Hitler got away with it for free? Anyhow, the little kid was quite patriotic and he said, hmm, he realised hell was in with a chance <laughs> if Hitler was going to go there. What, what, what about a system where he was simply obliterated and didn't exist anymore? Well, he, he would have got away with too much as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> yeah. so, so you actually well, prefer the idea of hell as a place of punishment for... But for who? Where do you draw the line? Do unbelievers go to hell? No, no, no. The only people... Uh, well, one, I hope nobody's in hell. Uh, we, we Catholics generally believe that there, there is a hell. I hope nobody's there. I certainly believe in a place of purification. I think it'll be like uh, getting up in the morning and you throw the curtains back and the light is just uh, too much. God's light would be too much uh, uh, for us. But I believe... Uh, uh, on behalf of the innocent victims in history, that the scales of justice should work out. And if they don't, 
life is radically unjust. The law of the jungle prevails. OK, I, I, well, I'm just going to go to our next question, which we can respond to some of these issues through that. It's a video question. It comes from Nick Walsh in Ningen, New South Wales. How can there be a compassionate God who is all-powerful and has created us, yet we suffer? Why create such a world in the first place? Richard Dawkins, you can reflect on that and the previous question. Well, it's hardly my business to say um, how could a compassionate God like that exist. Darwin himself said it, it was impossible for him to believe in a God who was capable of creating such suffering. He actually was talking about suffering in the animal kingdom. Um, do, we, do you assume that suffering is a natural part of the human condition? It's, an, it's, it's a natural part of the, of the living condition. Uh, it's, it's a natural part of Darwinian natural selection, which is one of the reasons why I, I was so uh, keen to, um, to, to say that I didn't want to live by Darwinian principles. There is massive amount of suffering in the natural world, a huge amount of suffering, and it seems to me that's an almost inevitable consequence of Darwinian natural selection. I'm more interested, however, in what's true than in what I would like to be true. It would be very nice if there were no suffering in the world. It would be very nice uh, if um, there were a, a, a sort of natural scale of justice, as the Cardinal was saying. But um, I'm more interested in, in uh, what's true. So it's not the business of an atheist to justify the ways of God to man. It is the business of a Cardinal. OK, let's go to the Cardinal. Um, the question was, how can there be a compassionate God who's all-powerful and has created us and yet we suffer? Why create such a world in the first place? Uh, I, I think that's uh, it's probably the hardest question for us uh, to answer. Do you struggle with it? Yes. Uh, if I get a chance to say, uh, to ask a question when I die, I think uh, I'll ask the good God, why is there so much suffering? Um, that's a problem for us. I think the greater problem for... And I'll come back to the, the question because it's a very good one. Um, at the, the heart of what we're about. I think it's a much greater problem for the atheist to explain why there is goodness and truth and beauty. Our problem is to cope with uh, uh, the suffering. Now, one of the, uh, one of the unique, uh, I think, it, well, certainly special uh, features of Christian teaching is the value of redemptive suffering. And uh, that is the significance of Christ suffering with us and dying on the cross. And that helps, that helps people. Uh, my, my first Easter after I was a priest, it was in the hills in Italy. Very sad village. All the men were away in Germany or Switzerland getting big money, home only for three weeks a year. And uh, people were, were coming in, coming to confession, coming for consolation. I was even wetter behind the ears than I am now. I didn't know what to say. And eventually I said to someone, well, look, Christ suffered too. Christ had a bad run. Uh, Christ died on the cross, and we believe that through his suffering, good will eventually triumph. Can I take, uh, it, can I take it to a bigger level than that um, village, um, to the Holocaust, um, to genocide, to famine? If there is an omnipotent and all-powerful God, why does he let these things happen? That's a, a very good question. But if God is going to allow us to be good, he's got to give us freedom. There, there's, there's no... Uh, alternative to that and but uh, he chose to intervene at different times in history to save the Jews when they were going over the river Jordan I mean there, there, there are many times when apparently God has intervened in, in biblical times why not now uh, well that's uh, I think revelation is is complete that's a, a, a mighty question um, he helped probably through secondary causes uh, for the Jews to uh, escape uh, and uh, and uh, continue. Um, it's it, it's interesting through these secondary causes. Uh, probably no people in history have been punished the way the Germans were. Um, it's it's a terrible uh, it's a terrible mystery. Well, I think I, there'd be a very strong argument saying that the Jews of Europe suffered worse than the Germans. Uh, yes, uh, th that. Uh, that's, uh, that, that, might, uh, that might be right. Certainly the suffering in both... I mean, the Jews, there was no reason why Lord, they, they should suffer. OK. I, I'm just going to... We, we're running out of time. I'm going to go to uh, another question. It's on a different subject. from Anita Wu. Jesus priest preaches, love thy neighbour as thyself. So, Cardinal Pell, how can you be against giving our gay neighbours marriage rights? 
when equality and respect are the fundamental foundations of loving and spreading love. Well, it's um, quite misleading and quite unfair to suggest uh, that Christians hate homosexuals. Uh, Christians uh, love uh, everybody. Um, we, uh, we believe that marriage is between a man and a woman, that it is uh, for the c continuity of the human race. We believe that uh, men and women are made for one another, spiritually, psychologically, physically. Uh, we believe that a uh, man and a woman as a father with their children is far and away the best and most efficient and most economical system uh, to bring up children and governments should support it. Uh, for um, a homosexual uh, couple to have uh, a union, um, uh, well and good. There's no reason why can, that can't can I, be... Can I just interpose a, a quick question on this? We are running out of time. I mean, oh. do you believe that homosexuality since it's not a question of choice, is part of God's natural order? Oh, creation's messy. Uh, the, I think it's the oriental carpet makers always leave a little flaw in their carpet because only God's perfect. But, but, but sorry, but, are you suggesting that homosexuals are flawed human beings? Uh, n uh, not necessarily. Uh, but what I am saying is uh, I, I don't think uh, homosexual activity is uh, simply the result of genetic makeup because we are free. We can control our uh, instincts. And like uh, with heredity and environment, a lot of this practice is, uh, is learned. But whatever about it, uh, we've got to try to support uh, uh, these, uh, uh, these people, show compassion. Uh, the Catholic Church has a great record there. We, we look after more HIV sufferers than any other uh, non-government uh, organisation, but we don't believe it's possible to have uh, homosexual marriage. I'm going to... Uh, we're, we're almost out of time. We've got time for one more question that both of our guests can answer. It's from Catherine Chen. As an atheist, Professor Dawkins, do you believe that um, believing in God for emotional support should be allowed even temporarily? Research has proven that people who believe in God has a better chance of surviving terminal illnesses such as cancer, as well as um, living longer when they um, go to church. So do you think that believing in God is beneficial for our well-being, even if God is an illusion? It's perfectly possible that, as you say, uh, believing in God has benefit, beneficial effects upon health. Um, it's possible that you're less likely to, to suffer a duodenal ulcer or something of that sort. But I do have to stress, I mean, that's an utterly trivial argument compared to the, 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 the truth of whether the God actually exists or not. I mean, that's a really big question. It's an important question, one that the Cardinal and I would, uh, would, ag would agree on. And if there is some minor benefit to health one way or the other, the evidence is not good, by the way, but even bending over backwards to suggest that the evidence is there, that um, psychosomatic illness may be healed, may be alleviated somewhat by a belief in God. Psychosomatic medicine is well known, placebos work. Um, if, if God is simply a placebo, that's fine. But I'm interested in whether he's actually there. OK, Cardinal Pell, final word, actually. Uh, yeah, so am I. Uh, uh, it's a question of truth. Christians don't uh, present God as like Santa Claus, uh, uh, something that a uh, myth that's uh, useful for, uh, for children. And f believing in God and being a Christian cuts both ways. More people were killed for their Christian belief in the last century than any other century, probably than all the other centuries combined. They died on principle uh, to be faithful uh, to Jesus. So we might get some benefits, uh, we don't, mightn't get ulcers, we might live a bit longer. That might have much more to do with our heredity. Uh, but uh, we follow Christ because we believe it's the truth. I, I think it does bring a peace of mind. It, it does help us. But sometimes it gets us into... Uh, my life would be much simpler and much easier if I didn't have to go to bat for uh, a number of Christian principles. Have you ever regretted that you do? <laughs> <laughs> sometimes I wonder. Seriously? <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> okay.
That's all we have time for tonight. Before we go, let's check the final results of tonight's Quanda vote. With uh, more than 20,000 of you voting, we have a 76% saying no. Religious belief does not make the world... Religious belief does not make the world a better place. Please thank our special guests, Professor Richard Dawkins and Cardinal George Pell. Next week, next week on Q&A, we return to worldly matters with Attorney General Nicola Roxon, the manager of opposition business Christopher Pine, international human rights lawyer Geoffrey Robertson, humanist, philosopher AC Grayling, and Middle East analyst Lydia Khalil. Until then, good night. <laughs>